Tuesday, Columbus voters will decide whether to enact a major change to the way Columbus is governed. Issue one would change Columbus City Council from seven members, each elected at large or citywide, to a council of 13 members, with 10 members elected by districts in the city and three elected at large. Here to debate this issue is Whitney Smith of Represent Columbus and James Ragland of one Columbus, which opposes the district system. Let's start with you, Whitney. By most measures, <coughs> Columbus is doing pretty well. Uh, population is growing, unemployment is low, downtown is doing well, neighborhoods are starting to come back, neighborhoods like Franklinton, there's been some improvements in neighborhoods like King Lincoln. City leaders deserve credit for this. If it's not broken, why should we fix it? Well, the real heart um, of the issue is representation and neighborhood representation. So right now, with an at-large system, neighborhoods really don't have a voice. And we've talked to 39,000 people in the city of Columbus to get this issue on the ballot, all of whom thought it was necessary for us to bring this to a vote to really give neighborhoods a voice and the representation we need. Columbus um, is one of the top 25 largest cities in the United States, and it's the only one that does not have district representation. James, are there, there, there are some parts of the city that feel they have been left behind, that haven't gotten the attention that downtown in particular and the short north have received. Wouldn't district representation give those parts of the city voice and they can get some help down there? Not necessarily. I think when you look at the details of issue one, districts are to be drawn by representation of 85,000 members in one particular district. Uh, the bottom line with this is currently all Columbus residents vote on all seven members of Columbus City Council. If issue one passes, they'll only be able to vote on four representatives. Now that I don't believe uh, is more representation. I believe that that's decreased representation. But if you look at the where the City Council now resides, two are in Victorian Village, three on the Far East side, one in Clintonville and one on the south side. Sure. There is not one member of city council west of Route 315. How does that, how is that side of the city represented? Well, uh, I'd want to know when's the last time from someone west of 315 actually ran for Columbus City oh, Council. Isn't the system set up where it's hard for those folks to run because they need a lot of money? No, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely not, now? absolutely not. Someone from the hilltop can go and get petitions and run for city council or run for the mayor just like I did. Uh, I'm not rich at all. I didn't have a lot of corporate backing at all, but uh, I was able to get the people in my community to surround me and go out and get those petitions, and it didn't cost us a lot to be able to get on the ballot. You're on the ballot, but you didn't even come close. Sure, but the issue is I ran. And what we're asking right now is whether or not a change in Columbus City Council structure allows you to run uh, as easily as it does uh, with the ward system as you can with a, an, an at-large system like we have right now. And studies show that that's not necessarily true. If you look at Austin, uh, if you look at Seattle, it infused more money into politics. It infused more money into the council races than what they've had in, in recent history. 85,000 people, Whitney, that's the size of Dublin, Worthington, Whitehall, and Bexley combined. One person can represent all those people? Well, right now, we're the current city council, seven people represent over 800,000 people. So when we're talking about this issue, we really need to talk to, to neighborhoods and people and your neighbors. So what we have done is we have done that. We said, do you even know who these seven people are that represent you? Have they ever walked in your neighborhood? Do you feel like you can talk to them? And that answer is no. So district representation and neighborhood representation gives people when they have an issue to say I have a specific person that knows me that's from my area that I can talk to right now seven people at large to represent 800,000 people and it's a part-time job I mean that doesn't even seem fair to them getting to the the makeup of the council under your proposal which the issue the issue voters will decide we go from seven to 13 mm -hmm. but 10 are now would be district representations and three at large doesn't yours go too far the other way in that it's going to lead to provincialism, <laughs> not in my backyard politics, maybe some horse trading between neighborhoods. Don't we run the risk of that with going too far the other way? I think right now the biggest problem we have um, at City Council is the lack of different points of view, the lack of different sides. Right now, if you go to a City Council meeting like I have been to many, 
Um, everybody votes the same way. It's a group think. They all vote yes every time. Most recently, we've seen them, them all vote to buy a $10 million parking garage for their sole use, that they also put a gym in it. If we had different neighborhoods represented and really had a voice, neighborhoods that needed fire equipment or basic necessities could have spoken up and said, hey, you know, that parking garage is great for you guys, but we have a neighborhood over here that has real needs. So I think a healthy debate and hearing different sides is really the fundamental um, importance of a democracy and representation. James, when, when was the last time we heard the phrase, a divided city council voted blank? It's always uh, unanimous. I'm, I'm not sure when the last time is that we've heard that. I think what people are looking for right now is effectiveness. Uh, the real issue is not whether or not uh, we're going to have bedlam at city council because people are voting against particular initiatives. They want to see a city council that's devoted to providing equity and resources to their community. And where I would disagree with Whitney on, on what she said, we've got the most diverse city council that we've had in recent history here in, in the city of Columbus. Are we gonna have every neighborhood represented on city council all at one time? Absolutely not. And the problem that I have with issue one is there's no ward map for us to look like to look at. We don't know what these wards are going to look like. We don't know who's going to draw them up. And it's being put on the ballot in August. And I think with that much uncertainty, we'll you've to, got to vote no. We'll get to those two things in just a moment. But first on the whole bedlam as you describe it. Sure. One person's bedlam is another person's spirited discussion where many issues are discussed. Now it seems at City Hall, the fix is in for a lot of the votes are already counted well before the vote. They get everyone on the same page, and that's why every vote is unanimous. I would disagree with that. Uh, I don't believe that the fix is in at all. I know the process by which city council comes to those votes on your Monday afternoons. And what I see is a lot of debate about particular issues back behind the scenes. Council members most definitely speak to each other and speak to their residents and speak to the neighbors in their communities. Council aides do a lot more of that. And a lot of the debate is back behind the scenes. But I believe that our city council is a bit more civil. Google what happens in Detroit when you see a lot of these council members that are against each other and they've got their neighborhood only at the forefront. You see a lot of bedlam, as I've described, so I don't like that. Detroit just recently went to district and for most of its decline and growth back in the early part of the 20th sure. century and most of its decline in the later part of the they had an art large council. So an art large council in Detroit saw the growth and the decline there. Sure. Uh, Whitney, what about the map? Shouldn't voters know where they're going to be before they decide on this new system? I think a map is really, really important. There's no map in the United States Constitution, and there doesn't belong a map in the Charter either. I think the biggest problem, we're getting hung up on the map and what's the map going to look like, but it's standard practice for a map not to be included. And the fact is, the last people we want drawing the map are politicians, are people that work for the city. And that's why this proposal calls for the people that do decide on the map to not work for the city, not be a lobbyist, and not be an elected official. Because I think when you talk about gerrymandering um, and map issues, that's when a map is already created and trying to be push a specific map with a specific agenda on people. But to be clear, your, com your commission that would draw is three appointed by the mayor, three appointed by the council. There's at least one of those three comes from a, minor from a party, minority party or a party mm -hmm. not on city council, Republicans yes. right now, and then those six would pick the other three, yes. which again would include a minority party member. Yes, so nine people. Okay. Um, let's get to the cost of running an election. Um, if a district is 85,000 in Austin, Texas, which recently went to an all district city council, they did not see the spending go down in their first election. What, what guarantees do you have that you're still not going to need a lot of money to run a council campaign in Columbus? Well, we don't have any guarantees. Um, and I think campaign finance reform would be a great charter amendment as well to make after this. Um, and many times when this has been proposed in the past, it was linked with that as well. However, um, according to the law, we can only be a single item charter amendment. So while we would like to tackle a lot of issues like campaign finance, the appointment process, just to name a few, uh, we were only allowed to tackle this one issue. But I can tell you common sense, when you're running uh, a campaign with 800,000 people citywide, it just common sense tells you that's going to cost a lot more. It, wouldn't it be easier for somebody, you mentioned the Hilltop, how nobody from the Hilltop has run for city council, or very few have. Wouldn't it be easier for somebody from the Hilltop to try to win over a majority of 85,000 residents rather than 800,000? Well, I think what we need to really focus on is whether or not implementing that will be 
a, a value add to the hilltop. And I think what the mayor and what council has done is they've initiated a charter review committee that will address those things, including the public in the discussion up front. A part of the, uh, the problem of what we have with, with issue one right now is the fact that there is no map. Uh, Seattle had a map and they voted on a map. And so, uh, you know, there is a map of the United States of America. And I want to really know what my ward map is going to look like. Uh, they did well, this. You know, what, what, what's, what's this commission going to look like? Who's going to be on this mayor's commission that's going to review the council? Well, the we charter? don't we don't know yet, but anyone, anyone who's a resident of the city of Columbus can apply okay. to be a part of this. And so the mayor and council are going to Do pick. Do you know how large it's going to be? It's going to be seven members. Seven members. And, and it will be picked. Uh, by and whom? Probably picked it, by whom? Uh, by the mayor and city council. Okay. And they'll pick those seven members and then they'll proceed to go out to the community and get the community's input on what they want to see with a modernization of Columbus City Council. Do you want expansion? Well, then tell us what you would like to see. Tell us your appetite for the budget needs regarding that. And so uh, I also think that's a more responsible ahead, approach. I would love to address that. Um, when we talk about this commission, um, it's really a political tactic. There are no teeth to this commission. It was only brought up to combat and help suppress the vote on August 2nd. And this commission, I highly doubt, that is going to talk to 39,000 people that we talked to that signed the petition to get this on the ballot. So let's, let's be real when we talk about this commission. It's really a political tactic to suppress the vote, as we have seen repeatedly in this special election. Well, I, would consider, I would consider a political yeah. tactic to suppress the vote putting this on in August. That's an interesting I mean, let's, point. Let's really talk about what a political tactic is here. Well, you put it on in August in advance of the biggest election in the history of the United States mm -hmm. because you won a depressed voter turnout. I recall in 2009 that there was an August election supported by Andrew Ginther and members of the city council and the mayor. Absolutely. That raised the city income tax by 25%. And it was where a necessity. Was, where was the call to delay that to November? That was done well in advance of the August election. It was they still knew, an August election. It was still an vacation. August election, but we spent a year advocating for that tax increase. The, po the so voters knew. why not knew. three more months to get it on November? Well, it, it was necessary okay. because we needed to know what we were going to be dealing with in advance of a budget process in okay. November. Right. And so this is not that. Okay. This is a group of people in a smoke-filled room. So no politics involved in putting in, in August in 2000. Absolutely not okay. because we did the work in advance of it. The, okay. the public knew about it for a year in advance. To the politics of city council, the last time a Republican was elected or left city council was 2002. The last Republican mayor left City Hall in 2000. Isn't this just a case, you're a Republican, isn't this just a case Republicans can't win under the current rules, so let's change them? By no means is, is this a Republican-led initiative. Um, this initiative has been led for five years by Jonathan Beard, a, a Democrat Central Committee member. He has been the, the backbone of this. Um, I've been working with him just only a year on this. Um, and while Republicans do support this under the form of good government, they have repeatedly publicly acknowledged that this is actually a Democrat-led movement, and they agree with it under uh, the form of representation is needed in this city. To the cost, um, the opponents of Issue 1, James, have said this is basically going to cost an extra $2 million a year. Um, you've said that there will be salaries of $80,000, which is only half true. It's like a $45,000 salary roughly and then benefits and pension. Sure. So, um, but let's get back to the $2 million a year. It's an $800 million budget. That's less than one quarter of 1% of the city budget. If it gives better representation, isn't that money worth it? Well, we don't feel it gives better representation. And we would have to cut some things in order to include that into the budget. And so one quarter uh, of one percent. We would still have to make some cuts to some programs and to some things within that city budget. Yeah, well, let's just put in perspective. Wendy mentioned the $10 million parking garage. The city of council just approved a $13 million tax abatement for big lots to move across town. It can't absorb $2 million a year, we're giving away those types of we're things? We're not saying that it can absorb it. What we're saying is the people have an opportunity through the Charter Review Commission to weigh in on that. A part of the problem with what we've had here is the uncertainty. Who did this? Why did they do it? Why are they doing it now? We want to be inclusive of the people. We want the people of Columbus to decide. If they want to absorb that in the general city budget, then we can do that. But let them tell us how they want us to absorb it. Let them tell us how we want to expand. Whitney, let me let, let's get to how, how city politics work. The key to, to a city election is the so-called sample ballot. 
let's say you win and it goes to a district, district representation, won't the Democratic Party, the party in control now, just add a few more names to that sample ballot, hand it to the voter going into the polls, and those folks will have a distinct advantage? Will it really change that much? Um, as far as? Representation and, and cha forcing change in I, City Hall, getting diverse I opinions? I think it will change a lot. So you, we brought up the, the Hilltop, and we brought up that there hasn't been a City Council member from the Hilltop. So I again hearken back to if there was a representative from the Hilltop, they wouldn't have lost the thousand jobs that just now moved to the other side of town. How do you ensure that? Yeah, how can Ex explain that uh, explain to me how you can force big lots to stay in a particular area of town without moving, knowing that there's competition. See, this is the part of the uncertainty with which we're we're touting why you have a measured approach to well, going about this it, through the I'm people. So you, you explain. Well, I'm certain what happens with an at-large system. So I, I do have certainty. Explain how you can ensure it. Explain how you can ensure it. I'm not saying it. I can ensure it, but I can say at least someone would be there to speak up because right now they unanimously vote every way. No, you just said that a, a representative from the Hilltop could have kept big lots there. Explain they how that could happen. They could have spoken up because no. right now they have no voice. James, I want to get to uh, the, a campaign tactic that I've just noticed in the past week or so. It, it involves race. The TV and ad flyer that you've been running, the opponents, opponents have been uh, running, show a, a sort of a montage of 25, the 25 member council, which would be the ultimate size of the council if we doubled in size of population. But all of the people you represent are white males with cufflinks and fancy shoes and watches. So that might cause attention for African Americans who now have a majority on council. Your campaign manager, Brian Clark at the Metropolitan Club, drew a hypothetical district that ran from Clintonville to Milo Grogan to Wylam Park and said that someone in Clintonville might be represented from someone from Wylam Park, a largely black neighborhood. Are those subtle racial cues that you're using in your campaign? It's not subtle. Uh, that, is, that is the way that this has been drawn up through issue one. There's no map, so you said there's no map. So how can you say that someone from Clintonville is going to be represented by Wylam Park? We're saying it's uncertain. We didn't say that that is going to be the actual ward. We're saying you don't know what the ward is right now, and you definitely don't have an opportunity to vote on that. African Americans have been disenfranchised by maps through time immemorial. We've, I mean, if you look at what gerrymandering has done, if you look at what redlining has done to the African American community, we cannot be certain that we are going to be fairly represented through this process. And so if there is uncertainty, you vote issue one down right now and you get behind this Charter Review Commission that's going to go out to your community and get your input. So you're not telling subtly someone from Clintonville that you could have a African American representative on council? I'm asking them to read the language and know that that could be a possibility. What about this issue of gerrymandering, Wendy? Uh, when, uh, Whitney. Whitney. <laughs> um, so, um, it's, this could happen. It very much could happen. It could be districts carved out, like we've seen with the State House and Congress. Yeah, gerrymandering is always a possibility, and that's really why we took um, the district lines and the drawing of district lines out of the hands of politicians, because that's when we really see gerrymandering at its worst. But what I what really concerns a lot of us the most is the the campaign of misinformation that has been held against and been waged against issue one. I mean, um, that's, that's misinformation there. They say that they took the drawing out of the hands of the politicians, but the mayor and council pick the people who draw the lines. That's inf misinformation. You've, you've asked the mayor and you've asked council to pick three of each. You've included partisanship within that process. But they've also but then had you, guaranteed that it would be at least one, say, Republican or three Republicans as a member of that group. Well, who's the minority party on council right now? Minority or no party? It would be Republicans. Well, how does it, why, why wouldn't it be the Green Party? Why wouldn't it be Libertarian? It doesn't say Republican now because there are no Republicans currently on Columbus City Council. And so what minority party is there? And they're saying that they've taken the politicians out of the process. And in the actual ballot language, in the petition language itself, it says the mayor and council pulls the the people who draw the who draw the, the maps. So you don't think the, the mayor or the council is fit to pick those people? I mean, under that kind of argument, I guess we do really need district no, representation. I, I'm not the one that's <laughs> disparaging the mayor and council right now. You're the one that, that's out here saying I that the mayor and council I am not disparaging the mayor corrupt. and council. I'm all saying right. we need so, representative I mean, you district. Know, it's, it's, you all are asking for this. This is your language that you have to defend. You can't say, well, for, we're taking the politicians out of the process and then at the same time say, we're asking the politicians to pick the people who draw the lines. All right, we're going to have to leave it there.
Thank you very much, Whitney Smith, James Raglan. Voters, go to the polls on Tuesday, Columbus voters, and, and uh, decide this issue for yourself, even if you're on vacation. Send, a, send an absentee ballot in. Um, the entire debate was longer than this. Um, we have put an edited version on television, but the full debate is available at our website, WOSU.org, and we'll push it out on the Columbus on the Record Facebook page as well. That is Columbus on the Record for this week. Check us out online. For our debaters here and our crew, I'm Mike Thompson. Have a good week.